Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Any questions from, <coughs> excuse me, any questions from where we've been in our, uh, in our study, uh, our, I'm sorry, our readings? Just got into Ecclesiastes um, today. I think I'm a day or two ahead, but just started in Ecc Ecclesiastes. I think perhaps one of the most difficult books to understand in the Bible. And that's, uh, that's, after going through Ezekiel and uh, Revelation, I still find Ecclesiastes difficult. Okay, then let's uh, go on to, we're in Revelation chapter 17. Last week we made it all the way through verse 5, so let me recap a little bit. In, uh, in chapter 16, we had the, uh, the seven uh, bold judgments poured out, the description of them. And uh, then at the beginning of chapter 17, one of the seven angels who carried the, one of the bulls said to John, come and I'll show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. And we had a long discussion last week about who that was. And uh, my belief that that is, uh, is the, the religious systems of the world that have drawn people away from, from following God. And uh, we ended in chapter 17, verse 5. So let me pick up the reading there. Uh, I'll just go ahead and read all of chapter uh, 17, uh, 1 through 5, and then carry on into chapter into, into verse 6 so that we have some context. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls came and said to me, Come and I'll show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth had committed sexual immorality and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and it had seven heads and ten horns. And the woman who was, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on Rich, our forehead, go ahead. When it's, when it's been talking about the sexual immoralities, if that's the, um, the, all the other religions, would we, could we substitute the word idolatry for that? Yeah, you could. It just messes up the analogy. Well, yes, but I mean, in, in, in understanding what it's supposed to mean, it could be idolatry. Yeah, idolatry, as long as you make that a broad enough term to be anything that draws you away from God, which is really yes. a good understanding of idolatry. Okay. So in, in what's being referenced here, and as we move on um, in, in Revelation, I think we'll see it more. Um, the, the prostitution of this, or the, this prostitute, the world system is bigger than just religious. It's also commerce system. It is everything that the world uses to keep people away from God. It's not just purely um, religious. And so idolatry in that, in that understanding would be a good, uh, a good way to understand that. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels uh, and pearls holding in her hand a golden cup of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And her forehead, and on her forehead was written the name of a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. So that's where we left off. And remember, um, I have the belief that, that Babylon here is used because of the proximity to the Tower of Babel in Shinar, which is northern uh, Babylon, um, the Tower of Babel, Babylon, um, where where we can trace all uh, 
all false religious systems back to. So that's the framework that I think um, that is being developed in the first five verses. So let's pick up with verse six. Sure. Maybe, there we go. And I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. So in this, in this vision or in this scene that is playing out before John, remember, I think John is, is witnessing things in real time, but what he's witnessing may be a play, may not be the actual events because of the way he's describing them. John sees this woman who's drunk on the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Clearly, we're to understand that the, the, the false religious systems were very antagonistic to the cause of Christ, including the destruction of many followers and churches. And as I progress in my study of Revelation, I would say this is broader than just the religious systems. I would argue that this is all of the world systems. We'll see this in particularly in chapter 18, that the world systems that are contrary to what scripture teaches, contrary to a relationship with God, that the systems that draw us away from God are what's really in view here. As, uh, as a good Bible student, we need to figure out who the saints are and who the martyrs of Jesus are. Anybody have any uh, guesses or attempts there? The, the martyrs or the saints, one of them could be the, the people who became Christians during the tribulation and have, have been killed or died. Truly, uh, martyrs during the tribulation age or tribulation age saints, that's true. But is there more? Or I should the say, apostles? are there more? The apostles? Are you, uh, Angie, are you talking about the 12? The 12. Yeah. Yes. 12, the 12 apostles. Oh, yes. yes. What about the 144,000? Well, I think you would count those as tribulation saints. Then I don't know the others. Well, if, if the woman is Babylon, and Babylon represents all the systems of the world that draw people away from the Lord, could we say that that includes not just the tribulation, but... The, the church age as well? Yeah, I, you're, you're exactly right. The good critical thinking there, Ann. Uh, so I that, agree. It that has be to be all more. Martyrs. Go ahead. But that would be all they, martyrs. Would be all martyrs, would be all redeemed, I would think. Yeah. But how is that possible? Because the tribulation isn't supposed to have the church in it. The tribulation doesn't have the church in it. So I just how, said it would include church age martyrs. Right. If, if Babylon is the whole system before the tribulation and including the tribulation. Just, just picture the analogy of what, of what John is seeing. He's seeing a woman categorized as a prostitute who has been drawing people away from, from God. Clearly not a singular woman, but clearly a system or systems. And she's being punished, not just for the ones that she drew away from the tribulation, because that would be a relatively small number, but for the systems that have drawn people away from God for, I think you could argue, back to creation. Okay. I wasn't sure if, we could, if I could go that far. Yeah, I think if, if, we're, if we're talking about the church age, we can also include the, the, all previous dispensations. Okay. The blood well, of the saints would be all the dispensations, but the martyrs of Jesus would have to be from the church age on. Correct. Correct. 
And, and I think that, that, that's a good thing to point out there, Mary. I think that's, that, that's exactly why you have that stated twice. Because they're, they're technically different groups in, groupings of people. So you have the saints, which would be, I think, a reference to all redeemed people of all time. And the blood of the martyrs of Jesus would have to be church age and tribulation age saints. Does that make sense? Some scholars want this only to be tribulation age saints. And I get that because we're talking about a tribulation age analogy. But I think it's broader than that. And I think the way it's described makes it broader than that. When we look at the false religious systems, which um, I believe includes things like communism, there are millions, if not billions, of people who have been executed for being followers of God. And then including in that or included or added onto that are those that weren't adherents to, to communism and every other false system. Um, false systems have been very militant in their approach to the church and in their approach to believers. I think martyrs of Jesus must be a reference to martyrs in the tribulation, like Mary pointed out. So we have both church age, and I would argue pre-church age um, saints, as well as tribulation age saints. Uh, so we have everybody that's ever been redeemed by God in view here that this that the world systems have been uh, have been trying to draw away think of think of Cain and Abel it begins with them right and, and the, two, the two different paths that they go on Mary's Mary's looking at me like what about Adam and Eve yeah uh, exactly well the 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 world systems begin with Cain and Abel all right I'll take your word for that one and, and Rich, so you go ahead you you are saying all redeemed do you mean including us or do you just mean people that have been martyred that were redeemed no i think all redeemed okay because drunk with the blood of the saints well clearly we're talking about ones that the that the the system has killed so that wouldn't yeah. be us unless we die yeah. in, in, for the cause of Christ. So uh, good distinction. Yes. Okay. So we're just talking martyrs then. Yes, that would be a, that would be a fair way to say it. So for instance, if I die peacefully in my sleep, I won't be part of that. Correct. Got it. Um, John must have have verbally shown his amazement at this sight. Just, just imagine he's seeing this thing play out in front of him. And, you know, we, we typically think about people that are amazed at something. They just stand there with their mouth hanging open. Somehow the angel that was with John understands he's just, to use a, a Dan Younger term, he's just gobsmacked by what he sees. And so there's a response to that, if I can turn my page here. Verse 7. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with the seven heads and the ten horns. Fast on the button. Uh, ten horns that carries her. The beast you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel to see the beast, because it was and is not and is to come. So it was and is not and is to come. It was killed and raised. Was alive, yes. not alive, is now alive. Okay. So the angel that was with John asked him, what are you marveling at? Why are you amazed? Then John tells 
uh, the angel tells John that he'll explain the mystery to him, the mystery of this woman and the beast with the seven heads and ten horns. I kind of get the sense from this that the angel was saying to John, why are you amazed? I told you I was going to show you these things. I was going to show you some sights. Why are you surprised that I'm showing you something special? I told you I was going to. In other words, it's, it's like they didn't, John didn't appreciate what the angel was doing, and the angel copped a little bit of an attitude with him. I told you I was going to show you special stuff, and you didn't see it. Why are you amazed that you saw it? The angel said to John, or, or the angel said that the beast that John saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. The beast will come up out of the bottomless pit. The phrase bottomless pit in Greek is the word abyss. It's interesting to me, the, uh, the English translations that translated it as abyss and others that translate it as bottomless pit. So, was not, or what once was, now is not, and will come out of the abyss and go to his destruction. And then, once was, now is not, yet will come. And then we'll see this again in verse 11. Once was, now is not, and is going to his destruction. So the, the angel repeats this multiple times for emphasis. And these descriptions are obviously mocking of God, who was, who is, and who is to come. In other words, the Antichrist, Satan empowering the Antichrist, is trying to present a deity-type figure who was and who is and who is to come. One of my favorite descriptions of God is the ever-present one. And that's kind of what is being said here. The Antichrist is trying to bring that persona on as being a timeless one. The, uh, the interpretation should be the same as we saw back in chapter 13 at the first appearance of the Antichrist. Back in chapter 13, one of the heads of the beast had a fatal wound, but then the fatal wound was healed. Now again, seen to have a Christ-like resurrection. We also get a sense of the Antichrist's power as he's depicted as rising out of the abyss. Now, we have to, we have to get some historical context to the abyss. It is often... It's often used with the same word uh, or with the word Hades. What is Hades? Place of the dead. For whom? Jewish people before the resurrection. Well, more precisely for, for the Greco Roman world. Yeah. Greco Roman world. Okay. So, Hades was the place of the dead and of the gods of the dead. So it's a perfect description for where, where these creatures, these, I shouldn't use the word creature, where these fallen people will end up or where will they, will, wow, could I talk maybe? Where they will be. And you have to understand that when these words are used, first century readers would have been understanding the Greco-Roman idea of Hades. They're not understanding a bottomless pit like we think of in the end of the book of Revelation. They're thinking of the place of the, the, place of the dead, Hades. And so it, it's, it's terms that cause us to be confused sometimes, I think. Um, we know that the first century understanding of the abyss was the abode of demons. In chapter 9, we're, we're, we were introduced to Apollyon the king of the locust demon mode or horde who had come up out of the abyss. In chapter 13, the Antichrist comes out of the sea. And in 13.1, or, or, or then in 13.1, now from the pit. 
We are also given this, this information in Revelation 11, 7. And some have taken these multiple passages and concluded that the final Antichrist might be a polyon wrapped in human flesh. I think that's a step too far. Um, but I understand why they get to that. Because there's so many like references, so many like statements that they put two and two together. So I understand that. Despite the identification... Go ahead. Do you think it's possible that the Antichrist is indwelt by Satan? Yeah. Certainly controlled by Satan, um, empowered by Satan. Whether it is indwelt, empowered, whatever word you want to use, I think, yeah, it's absolutely not, not only possessed. possible, I think it has to be. Demon possessed. Yeah. And so if the, if the, uh, if the head demon's doing it, Despite the identification of the Antichrist, Antichrist, what is clear is that all will go to destruction. Or yeah. is that he will go to destruction. I'm sorry. That he will go to destruction. Look at verse 8 closely. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the abyss or the bottomless pit and do what? Go to destruction. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Because when we think of the bottomless pit, I always, I kind of equate it with the lake of fire, but it isn't because that's the destruction. Yeah. Uh, even being res uh, resurrected will not protect the Antichrist. He will go to destruction. Now, it all depends on what we understand destruction to mean. Is it physical destruction and eternal separation from God? I would argue that's probable. Um, but the annihilationist would say that it's not. And so it all depends on what, what, what destruction means. And I don't know that I have the capacity to answer that question today. Because after doing the peer review stuff on the annihilation book, I'm still at odds, not, not with not with eternal damnation. I'm not at odds with that at all. I'm at odds with how we define some words. And uh, I think there will be eternal damnation and eternal separation and eternal torment. But how we define words in that discussion, I, I have some struggle with. Regardless of how we define it, it's going to be horrible. It'll be horrible. Now, this is the Antichrist. We're not talking about all his followers and stuff. This is the Antichrist. The beast is the Antichrist. The unredeemed people left on earth, those whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, the unregenerate and the unregeneratable will marvel at the Antichrist because it appears time. He appears, it appears timeless. Just like God. It's blasphemous because he's taking the position of God. The unredeemed will fall for the treachery of Satan and continue to draw people away from seeing God by providing an alternative false God. A false God that I might add, people are more inclined to follow. Isn't that interesting? A false God people are more inclined to follow than a true God. But isn't that always been true? Yes. Because, because to follow God requires sacrifice, self-discipline, whatever you want to put in that spot. And often false religions don't require that. Right. Which is why they don't require it. And, so they become more attractive. And Jesus said it himself. He says it's a narrow road and a wide road in a right. sense. Right. Good insights. The fact that those who are deceived are the ones whose names are not written from the foundation of the world also means that those who are not deceived are the ones whose names are written in the book of life. When I was studying this, I looked at that statement. Let me read it to you again. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. 
the ones that are not redeemable, the ones that are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, fall for the false god. The one, the ones who are written in the Book of Life, don't fall for the false god. God does it all. This just adds to my to my understanding of how the salvific process works, how salvation works. I'm not responsible for it. I don't do it. God did it, not me. That's a pretty telling verse. It's great. Yeah. I, I love how these things come together like that. There's some, I've got in my notes here, there is some great theological importance in this verse. God sees to it that those whose names are recorded in the book of life from before creation will have the ability to see through the false narrative of, of Satan and recognize the one true God. Notice I didn't say make you believe. He provides everything for you so that you will believe, but he doesn't make you believe. But you can't not believe. I'm just waiting for the smoke to come out of Esther's ears. <laughs> I said that just for you, Esther. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate it. <laughs> this is called, this, this process that God gives believers and future believers, it's called discernment. God gives you at the right time the ability to discern truth from false, from a falsehood. Gives you the ability to discern his calling from Satan's calling. That's all his work, not our work. I think part of the message that John is getting here. Now think about John. Spent three and a half years with Jesus, then took care of Jesus' mother, became the longest serving apostle, now close to 100, 100 years old, having worked in, in, on the island of Patmos, making little rocks out of big rocks at 90 plus years of age. And he's getting a lesson now in the sovereignty of God. He's getting a lesson now in the, the reality that God prepares us for what he puts in front of us. I think this verse is one of the most amazing verses in all of Revelation. He planned to save and to not save from the beginning, from before creation. Any questions on that? I wonder why I didn't recognize that verse before today. <laughs> well, that's my job. It's called illumination. Yep. Well, I really have been struggling and pondering and going over and over all of this because it's a direct difference from, what, 40 plus years of study. And we can blame Uncle Bernie. This is what illumination Bernie. looks like. Yeah. And you can blame <laughs> Uncle Bernie and Grace for it. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, chapter 17, verse 9. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also <laughs> seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, and another has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seventh, and it goes to, the, to destruction. So let's, let's take a look at this. Many Revelation scholars have articulated that these three verses are some of the most, if not the most, difficult in all of Revelation to interpret. But then in verse 10, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the, the only other time in the book of Revelation that John calls for wisdom is in the understanding of the name of the Antichrist number 666. So John starts out with, it's going to take some wisdom to get this. In other words, I'm writing this. Yeah, you're probably not going to understand it, at least at first. 
It's going to take some wisdom. It's going to take some discernment. It's going to take some illumination <laughs> to, to understand it. It's going to... Now, you're reminding me of my dad. He used to do Sunday school things with, his, with flashlights. Yeah, what's not like about flashlights? <laughs> Your dad and flashlights? See how bright it is? Your dad ever worked around flashlights? <laughs> we had so many flashlights, you cannot believe. I gave boxes of them away. I thought it was just the bulbs. <laughs> well, you had to have flashlights put in the bulbs, put the bulbs in. <laughs> So John says that the interpretation of the seven heads is that the seven heads represent seven mountains on which the woman is seated. But then in verse 10, he says the seven heads represent seven kings, five kings who have already fallen. When John writes this, one is and one is to come. What was the ruling power at the time John writes this? Rome. Rome. Rome is built on... Seven hills. Seven hills. Seven hills. Seven hills of Rome. I, there was a time in my life I could name them. I oh. cannot anymore. I, don't I, even I, I, only, I only remember the Palatine Hill. Yeah, and I, I was to, waiting for you to tell me that that wasn't going to be true, that it wasn't the seven hills of Rome. Well, just hang on. You'll, you'll get it. Um, at the time of this writing, Rome was the world power. Rome is built on seven hills. Ancient writers such as Cicero and Virgil called Rome Herbs Septicolis, seven-hilled cities, city. Every first century reader would have seen the connection immediately. John also says that the seven heads represent seven kings. So if we put them together, seven heads, seven hills seven kings would be seven emperors correct mm -hmm. all sorts of of attempts to make this fit roman emperors have been made but, man, but none of them fits <laughs> so well i'll wait till you get there <laughs> none of them fits very well I, I, when I was studying this, I went through all sorts of, of different uh, um, list, listings where depending on which emperor you start with and which ones you throw out, it works. But see, that's all arbitrary. We don't know which emperor uh, we are to begin with, nor which ones to include in the list since there were way more than seven emperors. A symbolic interpretation seen seven as the number of completion. Five fallen kings is nearing completion. Then one king that was current to John, leaving only the Antichrist. That doesn't seem very convincing. Let me read to you what the Holman New Testament commentary states. A much more satisfying interpretation is achieved by noting that verse 10 indicates that the Antichrist monster exists throughout at least several lifetimes. He is not limited to a single individual, but rather is raw military political power hostile to God. Go back to the commentary in chapter 13. Further, the term king can surely represent the entire kingdom of that king. This follows that the common ancient concept of corporate solidarity, one representing many. Corporate solidarity, for example, explains why the death of Goliath, one man, brought disaster for the entire Philistine army in 1 Samuel 17. It also explains Daniel's explanation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream about a four metal image. The four metals are four kingdoms. In Daniel chapter 2. Yet the gold head of the image, Babylon, is Nebuchadnezzar the individual. You are the head of gold. In other words, the king rep is representative of the kingdom. I would argue that it's not the Antichrist that exists throughout several lifetimes. I'm, I'm now talking, not, uh, not uh, New, uh, Holman New Testament commentary. I would argue that the 
that it's not the Antichrist that exists throughout several lifetimes, but the idea and the fight against God led by Satan that has been displayed throughout world history. A review of scripture reveals that there have in fact been five great armies that have threatened God's chosen people. Those five great armies are Egypt. Egypt, uh, let, me, let me make that full screen so you can see it all. Egypt uh, holding possession of, of uh, the Hebrews and, uh, and finally let them go. But then what did Pharaoh do? He went after them. And they drowned in the, in the Red Sea because of it. Then Assyria, 2 Kings 15, a, a tremendous force to be reckoned with, some vile, nasty, evil killers, much like ISIS today, ended up taking the 10 northern tribes into captivity, 722. Then ba Babylon in 2 Kings 25 uh, destroyed the two southern tribes and took many into captivity, sacked and burned the city of Jerusalem and the temple in 605 to 586, 2 Kings 25. Then Persia, the book of Esther, look how close Haman, the Agagite, came to killing off every Jew in, uh, in, uh, um, in Persia. He came very close to it. And then one that people don't think about, <coughs> and you don't have biblical reference, direct biblical reference to, but the Seleucid Empire, we have... We have a veiled reference to it in Daniel 8 and Daniel 11 and the book, the two books of Maccabees in the Apocrypha. What are you waiting to? Alexander hey. the Great. Oh, Alexander the Great uh, oh, conquers uh, from, uh, from Spain to, uh, to uh, Persia, to India, really. And uh, he dies at a young age, I think 36, if, if I remember right. And... I his, his empire is divided up among his four generals, two of which became the, uh, the, the, uh, the primary leaders, Seleucid and Ptolemies, and they begin fighting back and forth over, uh, over, they begin fighting back and forth over the property. And at some time, the Seleucids are in control. Sometime the Ptolemies are in control, but the Seleucids are the ones that uh, that caused the most damage in Israel and that caused the Maccabean revolt. The Seleucids were in power when Antiochus Epiphanes, um, Antiochus the fourth, the fourth Epiphanes, slaughtered a pig on the altar in Jerusalem. Right. That led to the Maccabean revolt, and that that few hours where. Israel was free from foreign domination. They really weren't. They just thought they were. Um, and the cleansing of the temple after, after uh, Antiochus Epiphanes is what is celebrated at Hanukkah. Mm. The Feast of Hanukkah celebrates that. I should, uh, I should say that the Feast of Purim is celebrating uh, the uh, protection of the Jews from yeah. Haman. So we have these five, five great armies or great events that have come against God's chosen people. Um, I think you can argue that these represent the five that were, as of John's writing this, Rome was the power seeking to destroy Israel. In 70 AD, General Titus, who would later become Emperor Titus, destroyed the temple and Jerusalem. And then by late 73, early 74 AD, the final uh, Jews give up or are killed on the top of Masada. And so you have, you have from then on, the destruction of Israel is complete. And it's, uh, it was not until th uh, 312 AD, when uh, Emperor Constantine became a Christian, that Rome wasn't actively trying to kill Christians. So if we look at the, at the text that's, uh, that we're given, um, 
it seems like what we're being told is there were there were five or john is john is seeing there were five you have them listed there and then rome is then now and then will come the antichrist let me carry on here the seventh kingdom will be the one world government that initially has a treaty with israel but then breaks it at the midpoint of the tribulation and goes after Israel, culminating in the Battle of Armageddon, where all the forces in the Antichrist are gathered to take out Israel. This, is explain, this explains why he's only there for a short while. When the seventh head, or kingdom, arrives, its leader will be the eighth king. The Antichrist will be the eighth king. The beast only has seven heads, so where, where does the eighth come from? The explanation is that it belongs to all seven, as in verse 11. Let me go back to verse 11. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven. Not to the seventh, but to the seven. And it goes to destruction. So we so, have the... Go um, ahead. So really the Antichrist embodies all these anti-God armies. Yeah. We, we always fixate on the Antichrist Christ being a singular, and he will be, but the, the notion of Antichrist, the notion of anti-God has been around. I don't know which book in the New Testament, but it says, says something about there will be many Antichrists. Well, Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 24. There will be many Antichrists. There will be many that come and say they're Christ, but there will also be many Antichrists. Yeah, it is. We're always fixated on the one figure because we want one person to be the Antichrist. And so we're fixated on that singularity. But in reality, Antichrist is a system. It is a concept that receives for a while a singularity of a person. But it really is a concept that's much bigger. Um, well, you could really say that the world is divided into two kingdoms, the kingdom of the Antichrist and the kingdom of Christ. Correct. You could. And that kind of yeah. makes it easier to understand. Again, from the Holman New Testament commentary, Bible scholars have suggested two ways in which the final Antichrist may be a reemergence re -emergence of an earlier hostile mil military leader. First, Antiochus Epiphanes, who figured so large in Daniel's prophecy, is a kind of prefiguring of the final Antichrist. In fact, some Bible scholars believe that while Daniel 11, 1 through 35 refer, refers to Antiochus, Daniel 11, 36 through 40, boy, I wish I could talk, 36 through 45 must refer directly to the final Antichrist. So in, in that one chapter, one is previous and one is future. Second, a popular belief among many uh, people in John's day was that Nero, the first emperor to murder Christians, would come back to life and return as emperor once more. This was called Nero uh, Ridivus myth, Ridivivus myth, wh whether final Antichrist arrives as Anti Antiochus, Nero, or unlike either of them, hardly mattered to John counted was his designation he or i'm sorry destination what the antichrist destination he is going to destruction so if the antichrist is both a singularity and an anti-god system it's going to destruction to make it easier i've read the back of the book god wins yep thank you but I didn't get any of that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm Rich, sorry, at, Elaine. but Rich, at the end times, there is just one main single figure Antichrist. Yes, yes. Okay. There will be a figure that personifies Satan's anti God work throughout the ages. But we need to recognize that he's just the personification of it, it, it is much bigger than just the one guy. 
but there will be a literal, literal antichrist. Right. I would argue that the final power, a revised Roman Empire, will go against Israel, but is led by Satan, who leads these other nations against Israel and later the church. Um, the linkage between the eighth and previous seven, who leads it, is what? What's the commonality between each of those seven on the screen and the Antichrist? They all tried to destroy God's people. Think person. Jesus. What? No, these are bad guys. So it would be Satan. the antithesis. Satan. Satan. Thank you. Satan. Okay. Yeah, Satan. I thought you meant who was they were trying to destroy. I no, who, who they were following. <clears throat> okay. Okay. The the quest to destroy Jesus, which is is hinted at in Genesis three fifteen, and carries out through the rest of Scripture, and this is. This is the, the, the picture of that. Okay. Everybody's brain hurting right now? Mm -hmm. A little yeah. bit. That's my goal. Oh, wow. That's my goal. <laughs> I was being facetious. <laughs> oh, I'm not. Was it? No. Mission accomplished. I was answering Esther. Mission accomplished? Good. Mission yes. accomplished. <laughs> because what I hope you do by, by not getting it right away is going back and reading it again, going back and looking at it again. And then the Holy Spirit will do this. <laughs> Verse 12, and the 10 horns that you saw are 10 kings who have not, not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. One hour. Is that yeah. literal one hour? Well, we'll see. Uh, these are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords, king of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So John then learns, learns that the ten horns represent a confederacy of leaders and people at the time of the Antichrist. Daniel 7, 7 through 24 gives us some background for this. Dr. Walford argues um, that the number 10 here does not necessarily require a literal number of 10 kings. He believes that it could simply mean a complete group of kings. In other words, all the kings of the world. I don't see a reason not to take it literally, though. Um, my, my practice of, of hermeneutics when I'm, when I'm trying to interpret scripture is I take things, every, I take everything literally, unless there's an obvious reason not to. And I, I, I don't see one necessarily here. All deference to Dr. Wolford. He's the, is, he is the, 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 the Dean of dispensational eschatology, uh, guys, but I don't see a reason not to take it literally. What what was, is, go ahead, Mary. I was just going to say, I thought seven was the number of completion, not ten. Well, that, that's part of my frustration <laughs> with it. I don't get it, but go ahead, Anne. What was the Daniel 7 reference? Uh, Daniel 7, 7 through 24. Thank you. Um, some have held that it's a reference to ten European kings. This was very popular when the European common market began because there were 10 countries. Oh, look what's happening. There's 10 European kings. I think there's 22 now. So that kind of blew up in their face. Um, we should not let the news of today inform our understanding of scripture. Yeah, we've got one lady in our Bible study on Wednesday mornings who's absolutely going bonkers about a cashless society. Just point out to her that if you're called, it's not going to hurt you. And if you're not, you're not going to get saved anyway. Maybe not tell her that part. <laughs> that might really frustrate her. John was not writing 
to Europeans. He was writing to Asians. The Seven Hills of Rome was as close as he gets to talking about Europe. It's better to view this as 10 kings from the world who go against Jesus at Armageddon. This coalition of forces led by these 10 kings and the Antichrist will come against Jesus. They will attempt to overthrow Jesus, but will fail. I typically view this confederacy of 10 kings as regional representatives to encompass the world. North American, South American, Asian, European, Australian, you know, all, you know, all, all of that it has to be more than, than uh, um, continents because we only have seven continents. We have 10 Kings. So would you understand what I'm saying by regional rulers? Yeah. The Antichrist divvied it up the world and said, okay, you take this one, you take that one right. and on and on. Right. And so they amassed the forces in their regions to come against, um, against, uh, primarily against Israel. They don't realize that Jesus comes in riding on a white horse and takes him out with his voice. But okay, let me let me finish up uh, chapter seventeen real 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 quick. And the angel said to me, "The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they are the beast." Um, the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute and they'll make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. And God has put her into the hearts, has put into their hearts to carry out his purpose of being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the earth over the kings of the earth. So now everybody's mind should be going poof, because wait, I thought that this was the world's religious systems that the Antichrist supported. But now all of a sudden we're reading um, that the waters you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and the multitudes and nations and languages and the 10 horns you saw there, the beast will hate the prostitute. What do you derive from that? They don't want to share power. He doesn't want to share power anymore. The world systems, the world religious systems are an ends to a mean, means they're not the end. False religious systems are not about religion. They're about being false gods. They're about being against God. That's what's, that, what we're being told here. As soon as it's convenient for the Antichrist to say, I don't need you anymore, prophet. I don't need you anymore, religious system. I don't need you anymore, systems that we have to control people. We've got it all covered. They're gone. Yeah, didn't he think that he can do it all by himself? Exactly. Exactly. So what I want you to understand out of this is even in our day-to-day, -day, false religious systems are not about the false religion. They're about being not God, not for God. They're about being antichrist, not for Christ. They're not about being Buddhist. They're not about being Hindu. They're about being something other than, than God. And as soon as it's convenient, the world will dispose of them. Um, the timing of what John sees here is not given in our text. I suspect that it happens early in the second half of the tribulation, that the religious systems will only be useful in controlling the people for a while. It was not until, it was not ultimately for the worship of Antichrist or Satan. Those systems will go away and we get to the end. So I would argue that this is some, it obviously has to be in the latter uh, half of the tribulation when John's not given, not giving us, we don't know. The closing, of verse, uh, the closing verse of, of chapter 17 describes that the purpose of the woman, the religious system, was to get power or dominion over the people. It's all about 
getting power and maintaining power. And when they no longer have to do that, the, the pretense of a religious and, and um, societal system goes away. Okay, I'm going to stop there because we're at the end of 17 and I see smoke coming out your brains. Mm -hmm. Big time. So I Rich, actually have. Go ahead, Chuck. I said I actually have one, Rich. You have a question? No, a brain. <laughs> if you saw smoke out of it, obviously I have one. I wasn't sure. Okay, got Rich, it. Yes, ma'am. Would you repeat? the sentence you said several times that the world and religious systems are not about something. The world, the false religious systems that the world has, has been involved in from the beginning is not at all about the religious system. It's about being anti-God. And many of them, many of Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.